electrician knows how to connect the wire to the right place to let the current flow. So that is a bit of an electrician. She knows how to join the wires together. When she was with you, you had her attention 100%. And she made you feel special. She made you feel that nobody mattered in that moment except you. I stopped in front of her and she actually said something to me that was, to me, it was so powerful. And all of a sudden, I completely started sobbing. And I want to tell you, I've never, no one has ever, ever made me cry in my entire life. I mean, even when my parents died, I didn't shed a tear. I don't cry. She does this every time I put powder on. She takes my sari <laughs> and she wipes her face with it. Behind those fragile little hands, there is a great story to tell. A story that is now more than 100 years old. It's an extraordinary story one that speaks to the heart of humanity. Also, wherever she goes, she'll always go to Baba's room before she leaves. For the past 20 years, Hansa Chapaneri has witnessed this story unfold, looking after Daddy with tireless care wherever she goes. Baba I think right from the young age, um, I've always been a caring person, especially with the elderly. And when I used to look at Daddy, uh, I used to feel how nice it would be to look after Daddy. Just very subtle. When Daddy used to be uh, going to different programs in the UK, you know, one hour, two hour drive. I used to really feel for her that everybody's gone to sleep and how will daddy come in and, you know, and she has to climb these stairs and she might need something, she might want something. How can I go to sleep? Everybody's gone to sleep, who will help her? I used to have these feelings, you know. Every detail is highly significant in daddy's story every step she took. And 20 years ago, Hansa could never have imagined the journey that would give Daddy the power to touch so many lives. She is the one who opened the door of my heart to allow God to come in. It happened in the first week of April in 1968 which date out of that first week I can't tell you, but it happened. <laughs> what happened was uh, she spoke to me about conscience and that was a very important trigger because I'd been thinking about choices and how to make choices and feeling that I didn't have enough capacity to be able to make my choice. Permissive society, Western traditional society, Hindu society, I didn't know which way to go. And she picked up on that. And so she talked to me about cleaning the conscience. And I said, how? She said, meditation. So then I came back that same evening to start my course. So the first day was the awareness of the soul and I felt as if I was flying home, I wasn't walking home. And then when she gave me that drishti, it lifted me into another realm. 
and gave me that experience of connecting with God's love. Janti Kirpalani and her mother always had a close connection with the founder of the Brahma Kumaris, Brahma Baba. Janti's grandfather was Brahma's cousin. She met Brahma for the first time at the age of eight and completely dedicated herself to follow his teachings 11 years later, at the age of 19. And if we want to tell the story of Daddy and open the book of her life, it would be hard to find someone more qualified than her. And guess who this is? <laughs> very, very young Daddy. Sister Janti, as she is now called, knows Daddy's life literally by heart and all the details behind almost every picture. You can see Daddy in her little jacket. <laughs> Daddy's story is what she calls the story of a spiritual genius. Daddy's earliest memory is of being two years of age in her cradle and she was hearing her uncle chant the name of Rama, the name of God. And so she was born into a very religious family, a philanthropic family. Her parents decided that rather than put her in a normal school, a pundit would come home and would teach her at home from the scriptures. And this continued till age nine. And at that time then she went to school just for three years. And in three years she managed to pass six different levels. Um, she was a bright student as you can imagine. <laughs> At age 11, um, she said to her father, um, it was time to study science at school. And she said to her father that science might change my mind about God and take me away from God. And I don't want that to happen. So let me have my further education by going on pilgrimage. And so her father shut up shop and took her on pilgrimage to the four corners of India. And the question that she had for the sages that she would meet on her pilgrimages was, tell me your experience of God. Don't talk to me about God or what the scriptures say. Tell me your personal experience. And from the blank look in their eyes, she knew that it was something they were striving for, but they hadn't yet come to. It tells me that this has been the whole of her life. There hasn't been any other interest in her life except to know God and to know the self, and secondly, to serve humanity. Not far from where Daddy lived, another story was just about to unfold. The story of Dada Lekraj. Born in a very religious family, the son of a school teacher in Hyderabad in the state of Sindh, Dada Lekraj had been on a spiritual quest since the early 1930s. When he was approaching his age of retirement, he underwent a series of visionary experiences that would transform him completely. Seeking a higher understanding of God and divine truth, he created a spiritual gathering called Om Mandali, which later would become the Brahma Kumaris. And just a few months before he passed away, Sister Janti already had decided which path to follow. She would quickly become one of the main voices of the Brahma Kumaris outside of India and a brilliant spokesperson to make the teachings known at all levels of society. What did you do to it? Uh, I fell over my, the handlebars of my bike. I went to pick up the laundry. On the now based in London, Sister Janti knows how much Daddy Janki's spiritual presence can impact those she meets. Lord Stone came to know Daddy and the Brahma Kumaris over 20 years ago, about the same time he joined the House of Lords in England. Thus began 20 years of spiritual friendship that would bring a new perspective to his work around the world. Because I'm dyslexic and dyspraxic and um, not talented, I don't think in a logical, linear, linguistic way, I read people's sort of vibrations. And what I get from here is that the vibration is just full of love and compassion. And that's uh, what uh, makes me 
trust them and mm. know that they can be trusted. Now, what the Brahma Morris and Daddy Janky in particular taught me was that there isn't only one truth, that there's your truth, Andrew, from your culture, and there's their truth from their culture, and that what you have to do is to open your heart and realize that people have different truths. And the trick is to work out how these different truths can live together. And therefore, you listen to somebody more intently. You understand why they believe what they believe, and you accept that they believe that, and you know that you believe something else, and then say, well, how can we work this out together? Now, this has been massively helpful for me. I'm working at the moment with Palestinians and Israelis and Egyptians and Jordanians, and what I'm able to do, and they all can feel this, is that I understand their narrative. I believe it, and I believe it as their narrative. I don't believe it as my narrative, and I try and share mine and say, look, how can we work this together? When Daddy Janky talks to 500 people in a room, she doesn't talk to the crowd, she talks to everybody individually. You see her looking at everybody's eyes, even though she does drishti afterwards, even when she talks, she looks at every individual as she's talking. In fact, she sits for a moment and looks at everybody, and then everybody knows that they're talking, she's talking to them. And that's how she enables them to get in touch with their best part. To enable others to get in touch with their best part, this could well summarize Daddy's life. Now well over 100 years old, her love for her close friends is always moving to watch. Her fragile little hands and her magic eyes seem to have served all her life to do just that, to enable others to get in touch with their best part. In 2010, Daddy Janky decided to revisit where it all started for her. For the first time in over 60 years, she returned to Pakistan, to what had been the Indian state of Sindh before the partition of India. This was where she was born in 1916. In 1937, Brahma Baba had just created a trust to which he surrendered his wealth. The trust was composed of young women to look after the growth of the movement. For Daddy Janki, this was walking in the footprints of her past, when she met Brahma for the first time in that year of 1937. She was out in the park in the early morning hours with her father, and she saw this person coming towards them. And afterwards, she said to her father, did you see that? And it was clear that he hadn't noticed anything different. It was just curtsy and hello and you move on. But what she saw was light. She didn't see this man. She saw this amazing glow of light. And that made her understand that something very unique had happened. And when she investigated further, she found the teachings that were being shared through this man. At that time, Daddy was only 21 years old, and before being able to fully join the group, she had to find ways to leave a painful marriage that was imposed upon her. When Daddy finally moved in with the other women, she was asked to take on a very special responsibility. <laughs> And at that point, she was asked to become the nurse for the community. And she took on that role of nursing anybody who was not well and taking care of them, um, even though her own physical health had never been strong. She'd already been through pneumonia and TB and all sorts of things. But um, her love for service was such that she took that on and um, they only called a doctor twice within the space of 14 years for a community of around 300. I think people found her a bit of a loner. 
they found her too serious and they respected her and admired her for what she was doing. And of course, most of them were beneficiaries from her medical care at some point. Um, but generally, the feeling was she is a loner and she's too serious. <laughs> but these years were, for Daddy Janki, an opportunity to create the foundation of what would become her unique ability to impact others in such profound ways. She poured herself into her love for study and her love for God. For the first 14 years of the institution, the men and women that joined almost completely isolated themselves from the rest of the world and focused on their relationship with God and their spiritual study. Other people didn't recognize her because the work she was doing was quite physical. They had no idea of the intense work that was going on in the laboratory of her own mind and the way in which she was reflecting and applying those truths within her own life. Um, because she was so intense, they sort of left her alone in silence to get on with whatever she was getting on with. So other people would have been very surprised within the community. But Brahma Baba recognized the jewel that she is. Yeah. People's vision would get focused on Brahma Baba rather than the message he was giving. You know, it always happens. You remember the messenger rather than the message. And so the message that Brahma Baba was giving was connect with the divine connect with the divine. And so people like Daddy Janaki who loved Brahma Baba, but followed the message and connected with God directly, were the ones who had the power and the capacity to carry things forward after Brahma Baba's departure. I देखती हूँ संसार में मनुष्यों की एनर्जी कितनी उतरती कला में ये रिलाइज होना चाहिए चढ़ती कला में कैसे जावे चढ़ती कला में दो बातों की शक्ति लेके जाती है एक आत्म शक्ति दूसरा परमात्मा के कनेक्शन की शक्ति एनर्जी बनती है From 1974 through to 1978, Daddy and I lived in Tennyson Road. And um, in that period, there was some weeks in which it was just Daddy and me. There was nobody else at all. So that was very interesting. Yeah. When Daddy Janki arrived in London in 1974, in the house on Tennyson Road, a few senior teachers of the organization had already been there for a few years, since 1971. But Daddy's presence would change everything. Every time I go there, the memories of the Daddies having stayed there comes alive. So it's still very sacred and special. And so it's a very special place still. Welcome, brothers. <laughs> This room has very good vibrations because Daddy and I used to um, stay there. We actually lived here in the night and did classes during the day in the early morning. So our early morning meditation was also here. The world was very different. We didn't know about terrorist attacks. We didn't know about um, suicide bombs. It was a very different world. It was around that time that meditation had just come into vogue and people were thinking about, you know, the flower power people. Have you heard of them? Yeah. <laughs> 
the dining table was there and the cooking area was here. In theory, I had known that these teachings are for the world, but I didn't have any example in front of me to tell me that this is the reality. And now I was seeing people of different culture, different race, different religion um, come and the way Dadi would explain to them, I would do some of the teaching, but Dadi would then meet with them, explain further, answer their questions, and then nurture them through the whole shift from being out there in the world to becoming a yogi. Still living out there in the world, but now with yogic principles. Yes, all our daddies are amazing yogis, but it, it took somebody like Daddy Janki to actually establish something here. And she was absolutely the right person because her deep understanding of spirituality and the way she translates it to others and how they're able to then digest it and apply it in their life she makes it so simple and natural and easy and of course demonstrates what she's talking about. When there's a true heart, it's a strong heart. I don't have to depend on anyone. If I make God my companion, so God is my companion. Okay. Thank you, Om <laughs> Many people would say she's very serious. And I think back and I say, yes, she was probably, but she was here for 40 years. So the latter part, um, she would be so humorous. Um, she wouldn't take a class without having several pauses for laughter in between. Jahan ke noor ho, tumare noor se jahan ko bab dikhai parenga. Suna? Tumare noor se jahan ko. Jiske jiska jiske saath pyar hota hai, uske noor se pata chalta hai. So the quality of her classes changed, the way she interacted with people changed, she was much more loving in an expressive way, not just in a deep, silent, yogic way. When she came in 74, I think it would have been difficult to imagine Dadi dancing. And then the last few times that she came to London, that's what she would say, let's dance. From a small little apartment on Tennyson Road, Daddy Janki brought the Brahma Kumaris to the level of a full international organization. The main center in London became the international headquarters for centers outside of India, reaching out to countries all over the world. And every location would develop a unique relationship with Daddy Janki. So her faith and her commitment created this building. I absolutely believe that. Um, architects were involved, contractors were involved, financial people were involved, engineers were involved, of course. But it was Daddy's faith and commitment that actually made it a reality. And the same for Oxford. It was also Daddy Janki who inspired the Brahma Kumaris to purchase in 1993 a unique property in Oxford. This would become a retreat center where thousands of people would come every year for spiritual renewal. Yeah, 
I think I must have been 26, something like that. Today, Manda Patel oversees the activities at the retreat center. Looking back at her life shows clearly how much it was her relationship with Daddy Janki that helped shape her destiny. And by the time I was 21, I don't know, something just made me feel like I really need to think about what do I want? Do I really want to do this thing that, you know, everybody... On the, there's a part of me that did want to get married and did want to be kind of, you know, have a happy life like that. But then there was a part of me that felt that there's, there's got to be more to life than that. There's just got to be more. She really had an impact on me from the first moment I met her. And um, somehow the things she would say about me made me feel that I would know myself through her. And I think I'm not the only one that she's done that for. She's done that for a lot of people. And, and I think her speciality really is that she makes you feel seen. The moment you're in front of her is that there is nobody else that exists for her except you in that moment. I don't, she, she touches my heart where I feel uh, 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 no one else touches in the sense that she makes me feel something deep inside me that comes to surface. And as I can genuinely say, there aren't, I can't think of anybody else who makes me feel like that. She's the only one who can move me to tears, actually, I can say, only one. There aren't many people that can move me to tears. Just being in their presence. I can just be making that eye contact with her and I could be, the Ganges start to flow and I'm here we go. Well, she worked on me a lot. Sometimes she worked on me with love. Um, and sometimes she worked on me with taking a, a little stick when I was misbehaving a little bit. She was tough. She, she had high expectations of you. And um, she, but you know, I felt that she saw my potential and had the high expectations. And I felt that I could, uh, uh, I, I just, I danced, I danced to the tune. And I know that some who couldn't, they just kind of got out the way. She always had a very high vision for people. When she saw the potential, she, she never let go of that, even when they didn't see it. I would be upset with her. Sometimes I would say something to her, I'd do something with her, and she would, she would kind of, well, don't do that, or don't say that, or something, and then I'd say, but fine, I'm not gonna say that. Don't ask me again. I did that with her a couple of times. And I have to say, I kind of, she played different roles for me. She was a teacher, she was a friend. I could say things that I was having difficulty with, probably with her, more than I probably could with anybody else because I kind of felt like she was always sympathetic or she would understand and she would say, don't worry about it. She would make me feel that even if you're going through difficult times right now, it's going to be okay. And she trusted me to go through it and come out the other side. Heavy. I'm in the garment business and actually the company I work for is the largest men's sportswear company in the United States currently. And the job that I do is called sourcing. So what sourcing does is um, when the designers um, design the collection, it's our responsibility now to um, make it a reality. So we have to find the fabrics, we have to find the fabric mills, we have to be concerned about uh, the quality of the garment and we have to ensure that the garments arrive into the United States on time. It's nothing, it's easy as pie. And my stress levels are low, et cetera. No, I do actually have high blood pressure. <laughs> This is the biggest meeting we've ever had. Brad Arkin is highly skilled in interacting with others. 
But when he met Daddy Janki after joining the Pramukh Kumaris in 1986, nothing magical happened. It will take years and many experiences with her before he could really create a strong bond with Daddy. Daddy Janki came to my office in 1997, actually. It was very interesting. The day that she came, um, I had set up the sh one of the showrooms we had downstairs. Was I set it up. I was like really excited and everything was ready. And 30 minutes before showtime, the power in my building went out. The phone system went down and the power went out for no reason. And I was so stressed. Like, Daddy's coming. I got her to come. This is no small thing. The power's out. And all that was on was one emergency light in the showroom of the office. And I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, what happened was, was actually really quite interesting. Because the power was out, because the phones were down, every single person in the office had nothing to do. They all filed into the showroom. A hundred people. And I was expecting maybe 15, 20 max because this is back in 1997, so you know some people might have been curious, but you know most people weren't interested. And he said meditation; it didn't mean anything to anybody at that time. And since we're an import company, she told everybody, which was really amazing. She said, "You have to import power from God and export that power to people." And actually, one of the salesmen in the room, who was like a real jokester, real character, told me that in the meditation, he actually had a vision of Christ in the showroom. And after that, everybody was totally touched. For, for years later, everybody, I go in their cubicle, people kept for 10, 15 years, they kept the program up and daddy's little, uh, some little note card that they give out of the program, they kept it up like pinned on their walls. For me, it's the same pattern. Like I, I'm not, I, I don't consider myself, even though I'm in a, a big job and I maybe exude a, an extroverted personality and I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily shy, but I'm, I'm extremely um, unsure of myself, like very insecure. Like I, I have no, sometimes I have no clue really what my qualities are after all this time. Like I know, I hear about them, people tell me about them, but I, I just don't buy into them. Like who, who are they talking to? Like who's behind me, you know? But the one thing that daddy's done for me, it's like been the ultimate confidence builder. I mean, she just, like she's seeing something in me that I just don't see. And, and every time I leave that room, like I feel more empowered. As the world keeps on moving at a fast speed in a spin of constant change, Daddy Janki's ability to remain so determined to share God's love with the world seems to give to many the strength to return to the spiritual core of their being. Okay, so this is a very personal story. So I have no capacity to love myself. I find it very difficult. I can love other people, but then when I try to love myself, I find it very difficult because, as I say, I had an abusive childhood. Um, Daddy tries to reverse that, and she can. And she is massively perceptive. So, I, if I can tell you, um, so about 10 years ago, when she was 93, and I'd been coming here for 10 years, at the end of a talk to everybody, she offers you toli, which is a lovely sweet, which I like, which is grown with love and um, pick with love and cook with love and given with love. She gives you toli, and she gives you drishti, which is she's channeling love into your eyes. She does it with 50, 100 people each individually after every talk. So I'd been coming here for some years. I kneel in front of her, I take the toli, I look at her, and she said, see me afterwards. So I thought, oh, what have I done wrong? So I had to wait till everybody finished. I go to a room, I take my shoes off. She said, Andrew, I have been giving toli, uh, drishti to millions of people. And I give you drishti, and everybody knows that I am a spiritual being, and I can channel from God and give you love. Everybody else opens their heart and takes it. You sit down there, and you try to give me drishti, Andrew. She said, I'm 93, you cannot seduce me. I am telling you, you have to open your heart and let me give you love, okay? And I'm gonna do it now. And she went to do it, and it really hurt. But I was able to take that. And for the first time, I was able to feel that I could accept and deserve love. Now, only when you love yourself can you give real love, and that's what she does. And if we can, all of us, accept 
that we are lovable and love others because they're the same as us, then uh, that's how she helps. You didn't come, did you? Oh, I have to stay here and make sure. Miskia. Yeah, yeah. Security. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know. Everybody else would do, Daddy. Security, Daddy. And also to open the house when people come. Over the past decades, Daddy's voice has reached millions all over the world. The past 60 years of my life have been dedicated is this. Her words have touched the minds and hearts of leaders in countless countries. Something that would have been impossible to imagine in the 1930s when Daddy and the other young women were being insulted and threatened for their choice of leading a non-traditional spiritual life. Who could have imagined at that time, that these young women would one day become highly regarded spiritual leaders. Duina Murphy Gibb revisits the Brahma Kumaris Retreat Center in Oxford and her friend Manda. Years have passed since the death of her husband Robin Gibb, singer with the famous band the Bee Gees, but memories of Daddy are still fresh. In the last few years of his life, Robin Gibb came very close to Daddy Junkie and was greatly inspired by her for his songs. So tell me, do you remember the first time you met Daddy? I met Daddy when they were doing a sort of global peace thing. In, in Miami, in your house in Miami. So do you remember your first impression of Daddy? When I saw Daddy, it reminded me of, um, you know, Star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The little wise person what in Star Wars. What is he called? Yeah. Is it Yoda? Yoda's? Yoda. That's yes. It. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, there was this, gosh, and uh, just this lovely feeling um, in her presence, you know, this sort of lovely feeling of just peacefulness and mm -hmm. contentment and smiling, and I just felt very, very happy. I think she has that effect on everyone, just makes them feel happy. Mm. Mm. And then you forget any kind of worries, you know, and I think, oh, well, this is something I would like to ask Daddy, you know, or maybe there's some problem I have I would like, like to ask Daddy. And as soon as I'm in front of her, I've forgotten. Yeah. Problems are gone. I, I actually witnessed Rob in meeting Daddy a few times and always felt his willingness to come and meet Daddy and be with her. I know Robin was lovely, he just sort of, um, I think he fell in love with Daddy a bit, you know, whenever she came to the house and yeah. was talking to her and he was very, he, he fell close to her wisdom. Daddy just talking, her wisdom coming through and things was also mm. um, almost like auditory, you know, I, I can't explain. Mm but he felt it was coming from somewhere else mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, she was a conduit mm -hmm. for something that was um, also fantastic in his life when he was writing his music. Oh, I've got some photographs wow, as well. Wow, let's see. <laughs> Ooh, is... look at that. <laughs> that is very nice. that um, uh, Robin had written a song, didn't he? Yes, he Mother of Love. Yeah, tell me about that he song. He was inspired to write the song, Mother of Love. It's a very special day today for a very special woman. Daddy Janky is 90 years old today. Being 90 is a great achievement in itself, but she's a very, very special woman and a great inspiration to me. And this next song, is a brand new song that I wrote for her. I know we were going to Wembley. And he still had it written on the paper. Do you remember he was actually holding the paper, reading it as he was singing? Everything we have in life is changing. You are all I need to keep me still. Mother of love. Angel of light, I'm a long lost child, so love in the night, mother of love. You know, 
know, sometimes I look at her love for, for God and I said, I just wish I had like a 20th of that. Like, where does that come from? You know, even when she said she was, even before she came to the Brahma Kumari, she had a love for God. I never did. I had a respect, you know, but I had an awareness there was a God, but I had no feelings of love or devotion at all. Keep me warm. Always be my lighthouse in the storm. Sometimes I, I, I just want to taste that for like one second. Like, what is that light? Mother of love, angel of light, I'm a long lost child, so alone in the night. Mother of love, angel of light, you have saved. Today, Daddy is invited to join the celebrations for the 80th anniversary of the Brahma Kumaris. She has been at the head of the organization for almost 10 years, and now, at more than 100 years old, she still finds the energy to continue. Daddy, program me jana jaruri hai. Logo ko milna hai. When one understands how fragile Dottie's health has been for her entire life and sees how much she has accomplished, it's natural to wonder about how she will be remembered in the future. Will this exemplary life become a memorial to inspire spiritual seekers to uplift their own lives? And for those who received so much benefit from her, how will they honor her memory in their personal lives? she became less and less present, you felt that missing. You really did feel that missing, that uh, now, actually, you've got to create that God's presence for yourself. And nowadays, people are asking me, like, I need to meditate. Uh, the other office we have in New York asked if they could have meditation classes as well. Um, and I never actually pushed it. Human Resources approached me about it. They said, can we have meditation on site? My thing, when Daddy um, does leave, it will, be, uh, it will be a big loss. But the only way to honor you know, her life will be to, you know, to become everything that she's pumped into me. One day I hope that I will actually, you know, make good on all of those things that she has told me about myself. I feel that I, I need to like honor her and, you know, what she's, you know, all the time I spend with her by actually, you know, doing that. If, if you're not walking your talk, it doesn't matter what you're saying to people. You might hear little bits and dribbles of things, but they're not going to really be impacted until you're actually, you know, really walking that talk. So it's, she's helped me walk that talk. I 
realized this is a film uh, dedicated to daddy and therefore I think that what you'd like me to see say is that what I feel now and again is daddy's love and it helps me but no the way she influences more than anything else is that when I feel I'm just going the wrong way I see that finger going like this and uh, she I can see daddy saying Andrew don't do that and that happens quite often I know that I have to make myself very strong, that um, at least I helped her up until this age, you know, to keep her going. And yeah, you know, no one's going to live eternally. Before, you know, like um, all these years when I was just helping her and, you know, like, uh, it, it was like, uh, you know, just a helper and, uh, you know, daddy's carer. But now it's more that motherly love. Uh, it's different, it's intense now. That, that's my little baby. And, you know, I have to take care of this little baby, you know, with whatever energy, whatever. Uh, you know, however I can. Yes, Daddy. What do you want? You want, Daddy. You want. There are not many people who are able to touch heads and hearts. Daddy is able to do that. She's truly an instrument for God's love, and God's love will make your heart melt. Okay, Daddy, Om Shanti. Daddy. I know that there's destiny and there's God and there's effort and all of that. But no, I wouldn't be what I am today if it were not for Daddy's. The hearts and lives she's touched. This is the legacy. And just like people here in this room, um, we've all been touched by Daddy. And so I think that this is maybe the, the biggest legacy you can leave, touching people's lives. <laughs> <laughs>